Boardroom Bound, episode 185, The Millennial Age of the Boardroom, with Krista Martin. These small pieces of friction within your process, they seem small, but when when you add them up, your ability to be a high-functioning board, it gets a little bit more tricky because now you're trying to manage so many one-off pieces that you can't see the big picture of your progress. Hello and welcome to this episode of Boardroom Bound. My name is Alexander Lowry and this is the podcast dedicated to intentional leadership in the boardroom. My goal is to give aspiring and existing directors the tips, tactics, and strategies necessary to transform your confidence and build a successful career as a board director. Quick reminder, you can get all of today's show notes at podcast.gordon.edu. And in today's episode, we're speaking with Krista Martin, and she is one of the leaders at Boardable. And Boardable is one of the leading, sort of, you can call it a technology solution for the board space. And that doesn't doesn't mean just where you store your documents and how you engage, but they're also thinking way down the road for what the future of the board space might be like. For example, they think it might be entirely remote, entirely virtual. We're talking about the metaverse, some sort of mind-blowing stuff today. You're going to enjoy this show. Before we jump into today's show, I'd like to share a message from our sponsor about board director education and certification. Want to join your force board or looking for additional board seat opportunities? In either scenario, be sure to be disciplined in your approach through the Becoming an Exceptional Board Director Candidate Education and Certification course. Get both the Modern Board Director Candidate Packaging and Modern Board Operations Knowledge integrated with one program. Remember, the key to landing additional or your first board seat is in your packaging. Make the effort to do it right. Program graduates also receive their globally recognized International Board Director Competency designation upon course completion, available in one-on-one group or on-demand registration options. You can learn more at bit.ly, that's B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash I-B-D-C dash dash D. So B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash I-B-D-C dash dash D. And now let's jump into the show. Krista Martin, welcome to the Boardroom Bound podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's an exciting opportunity for our listeners to understand today because what your organization is doing, I think, I think will blow a few minds, right? And and especially as we look into the future, what board space might look like down the road. But also today, we know many of our listeners often start in their board journey, perhaps into the nonprofit space. And we know that some of the technology is very different from, say, a Fortune 500 versus the nonprofit, sometimes the way the organizations approach the boardroom. And I know that the solution to that that you guys are offering today can really change dramatically for an organization what they can do. So before I get too far into the show, why don't you give us a little bit of of your career arc and especially perhaps how you've grown with this organization because it's really been some phenomenal achievements over a short period of time. Absolutely. I've been really lucky and proud to work at Boardable for the last five years, and that's pretty close to the the time it started. So Boardable, we do board management software, and kind of just like a lot of people start in nonprofit boards, that's where our business was born. Our founders were serving on many nonprofit boards and trying to manage the work and the action items from each of those meetings created a type of pain that said, there's got to be a better way. And so I started out, I was employee number two at the company on the product side of the business. And that's where my career is in product management. So really a big part of coming into Boardable was learning the board space, learning what opportunities technology can bring to really maintaining everything in one place instead of this this digital duct tape world that many boards live in, where you have maybe your meetings in Zoom and then your documents and Google Drive, and you have lots of important discussions that happen in inboxes where those board members, when they roll off, they're gone. Mm-hmm. So those were some of the very quick pain points we found and solved very quickly within our product. And throughout my career there, um, I started employee number two as a product and marketing manager. And as both the board management space has grown and our company I'm now the VP of growth and product, so I get to really look at ways to solve big problems for a lot of different users around the world. And we are now serving over 2,000 organizations 
over 2,000 boards and committees. And I know from reading into the story that if we just sort of put a, a face on the name, which you do very publicly, it was the United Way of Central Indiana. And the numbers here were sort of shocking. Like they were looking for a, a way for the organization to find a fast, more organized way to engage more than 400 board and committee members. That's a huge number for what generally when people think around a nonprofit. So it's probably not the typical, but United Way is obviously a very big organization connected in lots of different spaces. So I'm sure some people listening go, well, the one I'm on is much smaller than that. Maybe maybe we don't need this space. And the other caveat I'm going to ask you as you talk about it when you're saying some of the features and benefits, we live in a world where cyber and tech is becoming more important by the day. And so not only is there a risk if someone walks away from an organization that just the materials left behind, but the idea that it's not secure, someone can come in and grab it. It could be very sensitive information. So maybe you can speak to more of those pieces as well. Yeah, absolutely. It You know, there are so many options out there when it comes to technology, but when you are dealing with such a, what we like to call for our product mission is that we increase engagement and effectiveness of large-scale boards and committees whose members are geographically, technologically, and organizationally diverse. And so a lot of what you just mentioned actually falls into some of those those really unique problems that are created because not all boards are sitting under the same organization security or the same email domain. Um, So all of those problems that come with terms coming up and needing to onboard people into an email chain, you can't do it that way. So if you start thinking about really the governance and the importance of board work and how, how important that that board is making consistent progress forward instead of always having to take an onboarding period that could take you steps back is very important. And cybersecurity, just having one place that is, you know, two-factor authentication and being able to control who sees what without it being in some of these, again, what we refer to as digital duct tape of where permissions and access are all different across those pieces of technology it's really hard to maintain and that can be really scary for a board of making sure you're being ethical and you're thinking about you know that strategic plan forward instead of just getting to the next meeting so it really makes that that archival piece of all of the work you do just build on top of each other it's really interesting for sitting here as myself, as a director for one of the 30 largest YMCAs, which is a very robust organization like the United Way in and of itself, and has robust internal systems, right, for where they store documents, how they put things. But I am a sort of a key man risk if I think myself as a strategy committee chair. Everything I do is on email, right? Everything I put out there is sometimes very sensitive information. It's just the way that nonprofit board members who aren't given email inside the company have to deal with it. Clearly not the best practice idea, although many nonprofits would say, you know, we're running on a very lean situation. Cost is one factor, but also just the time and the expertise. How do we bring a system in? How do we get people up to speed? It's not what we normally do. We're not like a for-profit business that has have people that sort of have expertise in this. So I'm sure there are different hesitations for why some organizations will say, you know, we'll, do, we'll just stay with the de facto because it's okay and it's working for us today. Help speak to that for some people. We hear this a lot. And, and sometimes even if that budget or or desire to get that for the board, maybe that's not the problem. Maybe it's the comfort level of your board members adopting new technology. So it can, it can be a couple of these things. And it, it's, it's okay to keep doing that if, if you're looking to lose some of your progress. It, it just really comes down to that because email threads cannot easily be shared with um you know, those that aren't a part of it from the beginning or documents that are in an email thread can be easily lost and not reviewed on time. And so all of these small pieces of friction within your process, they seem small. But when the, when you add them up, your ability to be a high-functioning board, it gets a little bit more tricky because now you're trying to manage so many one-off pieces that you can't see the big picture of your progress. So I'll, I'll give you an example. Um, I joined a board and it was my second board I had been on. It was a different type of role than I had had before. It was more, much more advisory than in a previous uh, board I had served on. <clears throat> One great thing, if we would have been using board management software, I could have actually viewed previous meetings and, and understood what my role is a little bit more easily. So one of the biggest Uh, issues with joining boards is making sure roles and responsibilities and expectations are set on both sides. And sometimes without that, that 
almost digital representation of what happens in these board meetings. It can be difficult to get the most out of, out of the board members you're bringing on. And so an email string is not going to give you a very good feel on how do I, as a new board member, participate in my first meeting? What's expected of me? What can I look out for? And, and having a digital space like a board management platform, you really can. You could say, hey, this was the last meeting. Here are some of the discussion points that happened. Here are the votes that were made. And, of course, you can see that in minutes. But it, it gives you all the context of the prep, the facilitation, and the follow-up of what happened at that meeting. I'm sure many of us uh, in, have maybe some more than others. In the last two years, the, the world has changed in a boardroom space. Some people went through willingly, some people less so. Some people were probably felt more technology enabled before it started. Others are, are still feeling that even though they've had to go up the learning curve very quickly and it's been begrudgingly. Um, so understanding technology might be a scary thing for some people. And we could probably imagine this product has so many bells and whistles. You have to figure all this stuff out. And anyone who's on a nonprofit board usually has a day job, usually has a busy life. This is something they're, they're doing on the side as a, as a give back and a thank you in a development sense. And so some people might imagine this software package just, just has too much. We're only going to use a part of it. It will never be effective. But I think the way you guys have designed it is also not to have everything in there because it would probably be cost prohibitive, but also may not be necessary for these sorts of organizations. So perhaps speak to some people in the room that are a little perhaps worried about the technology and how it might work and impact them. Our North Star in product, it has to be an easy to use product because sometimes you'll have board members that are only maybe coming in for a quarterly board meeting. So some of those things you just mentioned of, of yes, it can be scary. There can be so many bells and whistles, but making sure you're building for that right audience. Who's building that meeting, preparing for it. They're going to need a few more tools. They're already building agendas. They're already putting board packets together. So those, you know, we include in our product. We want to make sure that administrator of that meeting has everything they need to prepare effectively. Now, however, you can also bring in some of your meeting participants and say, hey, can you collaborate on this agenda with me in this product? And then put it within the meeting so they can see in context where it's going to show up. Now, technology in general, as we come into the pandemic, um, it's changed a lot, especially for boards. So I worked at Sportable for five years, and when that pandemic hit, it was difficult for a lot of our customers. A lot of them came in who had never run a virtual meeting before. So there are not only questions about board management that a lot of, a lot of boards are working through, but it's how do I do the video portion? How do I now vote? Oh, this isn't in my bylaws yet. And how do you really level up your board to live in this new world? There's a, a fun stat that um, I've referred to several times. It's, it's from the Harvard Business Review, and they did a study over 800 boards. And prior to the pandemic, just 5% of boards were conducted virtually. Now, during the height, that number jumped around to 95%. And now research is suggesting now that we're coming out, it's more around that 50% of a hybrid meeting model, so virtual, some virtual and in-person, and then some in-person. There are so many different ways to run meetings now that it is going to be a little bit intimidating for some of your board members. But the big story here is it's not going away, and there are a lot of advantages of once you get past that login, which sometimes logging in can be the most stressful thing for a new board member. Get them past that and then just feel confident in the partner you choose in terms of technology that the experience will be very positive for your board member. Well, and just continuing on the positive trend, I know one of the drivers behind this was to increase board member engagement. And if you're speaking to, say, a nonprofit leader, that's half the battle because the board exists for a couple of reasons. One, to help give you the expertise you need, but also in many cases, they're, they're part of the fundraising or fundraising, or however you want to think about it, that they're bringing in friend raising, whatever you might be calling it. And you're, you're trying to keep them involved and engaged for lots of different reasons. So there are benefits in addition to just running the board meeting very well. To your point, if someone's just coming in every quarter, maybe Maybe they're on a committee, so they're meeting once a month. What do you do in between? How do you draw them in? So speak to the, the benefits of that, the, that perspective for the tool as well, if you would. In between meetings, I hope a lot can happen. Um, maybe some boards aren't in that cadence of let's also engage between that quarterly meeting. But something like a discussion that can happen in a secure environment. So, for example, at Boardable, we have something that is called discussions, which you can use in between those meetings to not only make progress towards the, the 
action items from the last one, but also just to build more culture because it is it is more difficult to build a board culture over a screen. And it can be difficult if you're just meeting someone for the first time in a tile on your computer instead of in person at a board meeting. And so starting to find ways to surround the board experience with other opportunities for, you know, thought leadership sharing or even making your board member feel like you're, you're bringing up topics that they have expertise in. And not only are we bringing them up, but we need and hope that you engage with us and, and being very upfront of, hey, we're going to start a discussion thread about this. It's going to be in, in your board management platform. It's going to be in Boardable. And if you could just engage with us, it's going to help us dramatically for our next meeting. And being up, up front with how valuable their contributions are and then giving a, a space to do it, that's, that's half the battle. Of, of really knowing what you need and then getting them to a place where they can see what they're doing matters. That, that is such a big part of board leadership. And um, another really great tool outside of that is getting others to meet virtually in between meetings. You, you don't have to always have every single meeting, um, I mean, depending on your bylaws and, and how you're structured as a board, of course, but encouraging your board members to get to know each other and putting – programs in place where you are having maybe a more seasoned board member meet with a newer board member over a video call. So you're asking for 15, 20 minutes of their time. And that is much more doable sometimes, depending on their schedules, than driving to a location, meeting someone new, and having to drive back to their place of work. So technology can start making connections in new ways, but you absolutely have to be thoughtful about it and you have to think forward of okay we're going to establish these communication lines at these times in between meetings and then make it happen well i know one of the potential drivers hard to predict the future with any certainty but we need predictions to help move towards what we think the solution might be needed that's coming and i know one thing that you guys are working on will probably blow some minds as we start to think about the audience the way i'll introduce this is we probably all remember when in the last year facebook changed its name and it's the organization now formerly known as facebook because it's meta now so you think about the metaverse and what that looks and feels like and i'm sure that's crazy for most people to wrap their head around but we saw during covid how many organizations just said 95% went virtual and we were required in many ways to be different and distant from each other. And I know one of the views that your organization has is that boards will be more geographically dispersed, perhaps entirely remote at some point in the future. And one thing you're planning for is what happens if the board meeting went entirely into the metaverse. Help us understand what that looks and feels like. For some of us sitting here, we can imagine how this organization we've worked with has done things for the last five, 10 years we've been on the board. What do, what do you mean it might change? How might that go about it? That's a radical concept, but the boardroom does continue to evolve. So give us some more color around this. The boardroom does continue to evolve. And it's been so fun thinking about this. And I'm sure many of our audience, if, if you know, maybe they've thought about it in, in different ways, where it's, I'm excited to go and, you know, see the next level of e-commerce in the metaverse, of picking out a new shirt in the metaverse and then it gets shipped to my house and I got to try it on and see what it looks like in the metaverse. That, that I think is much more prominent in a lot of people's minds. But when you think about this boardroom interaction, one part of our product that we've been thinking about is when you're sitting in front of a screen and you have so many different tabs open, it can be a little bit difficult to manage everything that you're doing of making sure you're reading the right information and making sure you're also building connection over your screen. Uh, so there could be a lot. We have tried to make that more simple with, with having a video component within our own product where you have your agenda that's open up at all times, you're presenting documents instead of having to, you know, share a screen and not see your other videos. So we've, we've dug into some of those problems. And I think what we continue to really lean on our, our customers for, so working with over 2,000 boards, the trust building piece can be really difficult. And thinking about building trust in a metaverse within the board level, I am, I am not sure how easily that can be done. Um, you know, if you think of all of the different possibilities of what this could look like in the future, a physical pre presence can be really helpful but how are we going to establish those relationships before you're feeling like you're in a virtual room and a representation of who you are that actually doesn't look a whole lot like you? So I think it's a difficult transformation for businesses in general, but at a board level, it's such an interesting dynamic, a board meeting of, 
you know, uh, you're you're actually making some really big decisions that can impact corporations or they can Im- impact nonprofits and the trust you need to have amongst those boards. I, I still wonder if that can really happen at the same level in a fully virtual metaverse world. So I think there's a, a lot to find out. And, and I think the digital transformation that's happening at the board level right now, it's been a little bit behind. It's been just skyrocketing because of the challenges that came across during the the pandemic and and now I think we're moving along quite nicely but I wonder how far behind um, some of this board adoption would be if the metaverse becomes a reality sooner than later. It's interesting as a concept because when I talk to some of my friends who basically are just professional board members now and they have a portfolio of multiple paid company positions, in some ways they appreciate the benefits of how COVID taught us that you don't need to be in person for every board meeting. So maybe you're doing two of the quarterly in person and two of them are virtual or remote. And the idea of the metaverse, it just means that they have more time to take on more board roles because they're not spending one day in a plane beforehand getting there and one day in a plane afterwards getting there for a one-day meeting. So there are some efficiencies to be gained. You make some good points about a board has to make a lot of critical decisions in a short period of time. And the opportunity to meet with someone face-to-face to grow that relationship is historically what we've always done. But now, if you're going to be remote and these teams are perhaps dispersed all over the world because now you can just find the right person you need who's passionate about your organization, has the skill set for you, and maybe it doesn't matter where they are. And maybe that comes back to some of the other tools that you have as part of the solution of being able to do the discussions in between to stay connected with people. So I suppose many of these things build on each other. Is that right? They do. And I love some of what you just brought up. So I, since I've been at Boardable, I've had two children. And that's a lot of change in the business I'm working in and the role that I have and then my personal life. And sometimes finding the right board to fit all of those things is really difficult. And one of the struggles I had uh, before the pandemic was finding something that worked with the fact that I have daycare pickup or that I am maybe going to have sick kids sometimes that might land on a board meeting where I can't make it. And so the accessibility and the cost savings of technology when it comes to boards is huge. And I think surrounding the experience with those those pieces that can still gain the trust amongst the board, develop relationships, is going to be the right recipe to get board board leadership and just the effectiveness to even grow more today. Because you you do have a lot of advantages if you can look outside of a geographical location for the right person to lead your business. And I think that's very exciting. It's interesting because I imagine when we started this conversation today, many people were probably thinking, okay, this could be a really good solution, let's say, to manage the board documents and to have them accessible in a central place. And I think that's true, but in many ways, perhaps that's just level one of using a tool like this to make your board more efficient and effective. And in some ways, all of us need to be thinking, how do we best add value to an organization? And the answer is probably it's not just people that live close enough to be able to attend an in-person meeting, right? It's a big, wide world out there of different experts, whether we're fundraising and different things we might need to involve in the space and finding the right tools and much the way we do, say, in our, our day jobs in the for-profit space of how do we actually do this as well as we can is really intriguing. So, you know, Chris, I'm sure there's lots of different permutations as you think about the future. Um, what are some of the other things that you're wondering about? What do we maybe build into this tool or do we think the boardroom space might go this way? What else sort of keeps you up at night as you're getting ready to fall asleep of, oh, I have to solve for that problem as well? That's a, that's a fun question. <laughs> um, one interesting part about board work is that you can have different audiences that come in and out. So you have guests at board meetings, or maybe you have a committee that spins off for an important initiative you're working towards. That isn't the exact makeup of maybe your executive board, but still doing really important work. And there's a lot of reporting layers that go between them. So if you think about structuring your committees and your boards, and then maybe even if you're in the nonprofit space, some of your volunteers in a way where you can really see the overlap. You can see the transition from project to project instead of starting over every single time maybe that committee rolls over or new volunteers come into your, we're going to call it a board ecosystem. And that is something I really want to make sure we continue to look at because 
there are so many great learnings that could happen between these groups that are often lost because they are living in silos. They are living in inboxes. And sometimes what you can learn um, by having a bit more of that structure in place is that you are being more effective in certain areas or maybe you have opportunities you couldn't see before. So I think that's one piece at scale. If you have 50 committees, are you actually – managing those 50 well or is that too many and when do you actually obviously 50 is very very many um, when do you know of of when those are working well and when they're not when you need to create a new one so i think committee and board management at scale very hot on my mind and then hybrid meetings you know we we are getting into talking about the metaverse but also when you are just in person and when some are on on a virtual or remote how do you make sure that that experience gives equal weight to both of those parties? And I, I'm sure you've experienced a hybrid meeting where you felt a little bit of that distance between those that are sitting in a room together and yourself on a screen. So continuing sure. to think about how to solve for that kind of that dissonance you have in that experience. Well, that, that makes a lot of sense. And what I'd love to do is, as I think about how to wrap this up, I'd like to talk a little about your own board journey. And I think you spend a lot of your day job thinking about how do I solve sort of maybe problems or opportunities with other boards, but you've also been doing some board work yourself. So I'm sure some of these are rattling around in your own brain as I think, what's the right fit for me or where do I find the organization I can add the most value? Perhaps I can start right away. So maybe talk to us about when you were looking for your first board seat. Maybe you're looking back now at that experience of what I wish I would have done then, but sort of some lessons learned that many of us can think about because everyone listening to the show is on their own board journey and you spend so much of your day thinking about the boardroom space and how it could be even better. I'm sure that's been really interesting as you've gone about your board career. It has and it is fun to always look back and think, oh, younger me, you had some things right and then you probably could have done some a little bit better. So boards, I, I definitely did research when I was starting to go look for my first board I had also moved to a new city, so that's also difficult, especially finding board opportunities, and that's a great problem that should continue to be solved, of of making it a little bit more visible about where you can plug into a brand new city you've moved into. You don't have a network as much as you did in the previous location. You know, you're trying to gain trust not only where you now have a position, but also in the community that you're surrounded by. So how I approached it was a bit unconventional. I actually tweeted out that I was just looking, here are my passions, here's my background, here's where I can, one, if there's looking for execution work, so, you know, if I have a marketing background, I have a product background, uh, I have a communications background, so just telling who I am and getting that out there, and then that led me to connections, that led me to a board, so that was great, that was a great first way, Uh, it was a bit unconventional, like I said, but without having the connections right away like you do in a typically if you're in a, in a city and have started making those connections that was one way to approach it <laughs> i've i've never heard that before i like that a lot sort of put it out there and see what comes back towards it's a very interesting collective opportunity and again if you're looking to pick up some nonprofit board space everyone's always looking for talent to bring into the organization so uh, and people aren't looking for just a jack of all trades they want a specific skill set so what a clever idea for how to, to put that out there and i'm sure you built network as a result of doing that even if it didn't lead directly to some board opportunities absolutely and then once i i, I joined boards i think if i would look back on it now I was really looking to make an impact, and I think many people feel this way about um, serving on a board of, I want to get there, and I want to make an impact. I want to make sure I'm using my skills to the best of what they need my skills for. And sometimes the organization you might be the best for isn't ready or isn't looking at that time. And depending on your bandwidth, and I know you shared some, some who serve on 14, 15 different boards, but if you are not able to put the commitment into that type of board (laughs) activity, you need to make sure you're picking the amount of board, um, I'm going to call it activity, right, of of attending the meetings, making sure you're prepping, making sure you are bringing real impact to that organization. You need to understand what that is for you. And so I think sometimes being patient and waiting for the right, right match to come is what I would have told my younger self a little bit of, hey, let's make sure we really understand this. What's your role and where can you actually see your role growing there within your term limit would have been really
really helped for me to think at the time. I had two really great experiences, and now I've moved again, which is why I'm searching for a new board placement, because those two boards were based on geography, and they did want those board members to stay within that area. So that, that is the change of now, if I pick something, what does it look like for me? What's best for my own family makeup, my career, and for that organization I want to make an impact at? All right, so we all need to stay tuned to your Twitter account to see what you're going to be putting out there for your next <laughs> board roles, what it sounds like. Well, Krista, we were delighted to have you on the show today and to share the, the great work that you guys are doing at Boardable. We appreciate you sharing your insights and helping all of us to be boardroom bound. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me. What a fun conversation. That's it for this episode of Boardroom Bound. I really enjoyed chatting with Krista Martin. It was fascinating to hear how Boardable has built the solution primarily for the nonprofit space, which needs the same sort of technology and tools customized to their area, but also how they're thinking way down the line to what the future of the boardroom might look like, including if we were to be fully virtual, fully remote, and perhaps in the metaverse going through all this together. And that would be another bigger change perhaps than just what we went through with COVID. Now remember, if you head over to podcast.gordon.edu, you'll find links to all of today's resources like the articles that we talked about in today's show. Please know that the Boardroom Bound team and I are so proud to be your go-to podcast for all things that connect, prepare, and empower you to land a board seat. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss any of the high-quality content that we're bringing to you every Wednesday. Thanks for joining me today. I can't wait to share more stories and strategies from brilliant business minds with you again next week. Remember to keep tuning in to be Boardroom Bound. Boardroom Bound.